Hello, Bookaholics. This is Deirdre Pippins, and we are continuing with our mental health series where I am interviewing authors that have written memoirs and other books that help people who are facing debilitating mental health issues. Today, we are speaking to Neil Elliott who suffered from debilitating depression and had suicidal thoughts. However, he found a way to peace and joy. And we're going to talk to him to see how he worked through these traumas. Stay tuned and we'll talk to David Neal next. <music> Hi, David. Hi, it's Donald Neil Elliott. The D is just the initial for my first name. So okay. uh, it's to differentiate me as an author and on the internet. But other than that, I go by Neil. Okay. <laughs> got you. Got you. Got you. I was going to ask, what was what did the D stand for? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. But uh, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And like I uh, explained earlier to the viewers and listeners that this is part of my mental health awareness. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And because I had seen so many people kind of maybe starting from the Olympics, seeing elite athletes, uh, you see Michael Phelps on commercials uh, talking about a mental health app. Um, Simone Biles uh, decided not to participate in certain sporting events during the Olympics due to, we later found out, grief. Uh, one of her relatives had passed and she just did not have the mindset to participate. Um, then as well, um, we had a number of high profile children of people would say Regina King's son commits suicide. A beauty queen who was also an attorney jump from her apartment uh, balcony in New York City. And because of all of these high profile issues and that we do know that mental health is a, uh, issues are a huge uh, problem and concern in our society, I just wanted to bring about light uh, and shed light that all of my guests have faced trauma and mental health issues and all sorts of human pain, but somehow some way and everybody has a different methodology they have made it through and have come out on the other side so i just want to present all viewers and listeners with a sense of hope yeah absolutely and i think that um i mean that's an important message for people is that there is hope um and you just need the right tools and processes um that are going to work for you Yes, most definitely. Okay, so Neil, you and I had a pre-call, and I just want to state to the audience from the beginning that you have come to a place after trauma, after uh, depression, you are pretty much, you know, as any human can be, a balanced, positive, happy person. Oh, yes, and I think, uh, yeah, Okay, we'll leave it like that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, before we get into what was happening and what was wrong, I just want to make that statement to the audience to know that they too can get on the other side of their situation. So, oh, absolutely, talk, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so let's first we'll talk about we'll name your book, and your book is titled "A Higher Road: Cleanse Your Consciousness." to transcend the ego and ascend spiritually. And it's, seven, it's a seven step process to inner peace, joy, love, abundance, and prosperity. Now that sounds like a book that everybody should want to read. Well, I hope so, you know, cause um, <laughs> I've written this book to help people. And, um, you know, I, I want to help change the consciousness of the world, and this has to happen one person at a time. Yes. And uh, when we do this, and we do this as a collective over time, we will bring this world into a new era of love and peace. Most and, definitely. Yeah, and, we'll and this... So my, my, 
I would hope everybody would read my book in the world and then make a decision for themselves whether it's something they want to do. Yes, yes. And I'll circle back to that thought uh, towards the end of our interview, because uh, I want to get your thoughts on or opinions on something that's going on in our world today. So, Rick, uh, Ms. So, Neil, take us through your journey. You know, I've taken a look at your book. I haven't had a time to read all of the book, but you said the fork in my road. That's one of your chapters uh, and your history and your path to suicide. Give us an overview of your life from the childhood to adulthood. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so first off, we'll give everybody context. So born in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, lived in mm -hmm. Canada my entire life, but I've traveled the world. I was born in 1960, so I'll be 62 in another month. Okay. Less than a month. Happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, uh, second wife, so married with three kids. We have a marriage combined, three kids, and I have five grandchildren, and they're all in Texas. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm a professional engineer with an MBA. That doesn't really mean anything, except that it'll be important when we start talking about the book. Right, right. Uh, so... <clears throat> I'm the youngest of six, uh, and my father passed away when I was five years old, mm -hmm. and my mother had to go out and work right away uh, to be able to support the family and look after the kids. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> I grew up, and uh, you know, I dis went into engineering when I was in my early twenties after bumming around a little bit after high school. Mm -hmm. And I uh, got an engineering degree and an MBA. And then in the 90s, I thought, oh, you know, so I'm in my mid 30s. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll see about adopting a more positive attitude. This is when positive thinking came out and all those kinds of things. And yeah. so I picked so I picked up some books, you know, by Wayne Dyer, or Carolyn Mice, Napoleon Hill, you know, you know, the list of books. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they all had great processes. Uh, and I believed what they were saying, but I couldn't fundamentally change how I thought. Okay. In 2002, so we embed <clears throat> our patterns of thinking and feeling into our subconscious mind and our unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a, a tool of the ego to do this. And uh, it's all designed for a purpose, and we'll talk about that. But um, you get that in there, and when those those patterns of thinking and feeling are uh, programmed like that in your subconscious mind, they're like concrete. They're very hard to break up and dissolve. So yes. in the end, your ego tends to win, even though you're trying to be positive mm -hmm. uh, or think differently, your ego will in the end win because you're just using your willpower against this pre-programmed stuff. Right. right. <clears throat> so uh, from I went into consulting in 2002. Life became about pleasing clients and work and, you know, making sure things are done. <laughs> so, right, right, right. so really ensconced in work. And <clears throat> over 2002 to 2015, I drove myself into this really deep, dark, despondent depression. Okay. I, re I recognized I was in that depression. No one knew because we're all great actors in our environment. Mm -hmm. We can put forth whatever we want. Mm -hmm. and uh, my family didn't know and so I picked up some newly issued books at that time and and gave this changing my thinking another go again mm -hmm. new mm -hmm. new stuff great stuff couldn't make any of it work mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. our house finally sold in uh, late 2017 uh, my wife got on a plane to uh, visit family and friends in uh, Toronto Ontario Canada Mm -hmm. And I sat down at a kitchen table and crafted my suicide note. And I was plan. Go ahead. I was, I was planning it out, and I uh, wanted to ensure. So it was going to be about three months away. But I finished my note, and um, I wanted to ensure my wife would be financially okay, uh, and I could say goodbye to family and friends without them knowing what I was going to do. A week. Wow. Pro okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. That's okay. I should let people respond to that. Um, well, that's a lot. That is a lot. That's huge. So let me let me just pause right there. So let me go back between 2002 to 2015. You fell into a deep, dark depression. Now, it sounded like from your description, and I'm sure people will have to read the book to find out more, but you sounded like just anybody else did 
at that time, you know, going to work, you've got a family, you've got your family responsibilities, you've got your job responsibilities. It, it, just about everybody does that all day, every day. What made you so different? How or why did you slip into that deep, debilitating depression? Did something happen? Did someone pass away? Did you get fired, but then found another job? What, what happened there? So um, first off, uh, so I made a lot of money and everything was good and mm -hmm. I am no different than anybody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so right. I think there's a lot of people that, um, you know, like I said, we're all good actors in our environment. We can put whatever we want forth. You can never accurately judge the inner reality of another person, no matter whether they seem affable and right. kind and considerate, they can be an entire mess inside. And, and I'm no different than anybody else. Right. Um, what happens is oh, right. that, yeah. yeah, so what happens is that, and you'll learn about this in a higher road, is that we create every experience and every event that comes into our lives through our thinking and our feelings. And mm -hmm. so what happened was that my pattern of thinking and feeling, what I believe to be right and wrong, true and false, good and bad, and my patterns of those things that I adopted and reinforced with what I watched on TV, what I read in the newspapers, what I read in books, you know, movies I watched, reinforce these patterns of thinking and behavior that drove me into this deep, dark depression. Nobody's fault. Mm -hmm. It is just, it's a process that we all go through. And, the, and there's a design, again, there's a design for this process. It is, uh, it's uh, an evolutionary process for the soul. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Yes. But um, that's what got me to that point. Now, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, so again, like I stated, what has just really charged my heart is that such young people in recent times have committed suicide yeah. and everyone just like people were looking at you thought they were happy the one young woman was a beauty queen and the reason why i'm so attached to her is because she was from my area mm -hmm, and she's mm -hmm. an african-american woman and people classically say african-americans classically say oh we we black people we don't kill ourselves that's false. I want to say stop that right now. Black people, as well as white people, as well as anybody on this earth, think, have thought about and commit suicide. And so we want to get all the myths busted out of that because people do commit suicide. And having those thoughts keep people from getting help or from you noticing that someone needs help. So I want to myth bust. I want to take all of that out. So this young lady, she was the beauty queen. Um, she had won pageants. She was also an attorney. So anybody looking at her, and just think about young people looking at her saying, oh, you know, she was, she was Instagram wonderful, right? You know, she was beautiful. She had a, a degrees, advanced degree, you know, and popular won beauty contest. What does she have to be sad about? There was also another young lady. I saw her story on the Today Show. One minute she's an athlete in college, happy, bouncing person, and then she kills herself. Her parents are distraught. They don't know which way the wind was blowing. They're like, what happened? And I really want to hone in on this period of you between 2002 to 2015, where you were such a good actor, as you say. You know, I want people to try to reach out to those parents out there that have lost children um, and, and, and other ages, ages of people. How would anybody have seen any? Were you that good of an actor that nobody would have seen this of you? You know, or, or maybe somebody asked you if anything was wrong and you dismissed it. How, uh, what is this? What is there? Is there any kind of sign? Uh, you know, I don't know what, that's pretty hard to answer, but I don't think there's any sign. I don't think there's any way you're going to know what's going on internally in somebody. And you yeah. can know that just from your own experience. I mean, you know, you, 
you're greeted with somebody, you're meeting somebody, you may have some interior thoughts or judgments about that person. Maybe you don't like them or you think that they're, you know, not nice people. But, you know, you're in this social setting where, you know, you'll be polite and you'll be kind and everything to that person. They have no idea that you don't like them. And I think that this is just, it's the same thing. It's like, we are all great actors in our environment. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's almost like we beca- we're, we're here and we're method actors. We adopt, <laughs> you know, that and we can and we uh, we practice it and we hone it. And, you know, it's just we, we can put whatever we want forth. So I'm not sure there's any great triggers um, right. for people, uh, right. you know, but I'm not I'm not an expert in that. I'm just telling you my stories. OK, so Neil. In 2017, you crafted your suicide note. I mean, the process of that, you got a pen and paper or you went on the computer and you crafted the note with the plans of within three months, I'm going to commit suicide, but I've got to make sure my wife is well taken care of. So you were planning each and every step um, towards that. And what were your thoughts? What was going through your head such as um, she's better off without me or what, what was going through your head of why you even went ahead and crafted a suicide note? Um, those are great questions. Uh, you know, I thought she would be better off without me, but that wasn't the compelling driver because, you know, you can always get a divorce if someone's better off mm-hmm. without you. Right. So I think the compelling driver for me was that um, I was just fed up with life. I was working hard. Um, it, life seemed to have no purpose. It seemed to be, I was totally miserable. It seemed like everything was just a misery. I was not happy, even though, you know, go on great vacations in Europe and I was happy about that and we had lots of fun. But when I got back to, uh, you know, kind of who I was and in my day, you know, it was just, it was a misery. Clients were, you know, a struggle and everybody had demands and I just felt totally wrung out and done with it. And it seemed like, why would I want to spend another 20 years going through this same misery? And uh, so I just wanted to be done with it. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, I will editorialize here and say, you were also during that period, because we know that like right now, 2022, and due to the pandemic, corporate and careers don't have quite as a hold over younger people as they did Mm -hmm somebody like you or I, if you were working in the 90s um, to early 2000s, I mean, it was just like, go, 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 corporate, 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 swimming with the sharks and all of this kind of thing, you know, and you had to get out there and you didn't have, a lot of people didn't have lives hardly for that corporate. And now I think one of the kind of good things that's come through this pandemic is that people were like, wait a minute, I've got to take care of myself. I'm going to practice some self-care. You know, this job is not going to control me. Even some jobs are four days a week now. People work from home or they'll do a hybrid work from home, come in the office. So probably, possibly, and you mentioned this, you know, a large component that that corporate world used to have such a hold on people. And if you weren't successful in that corporate world, you could have had a completely successful personal life. But once you're corporate life went to pot and, you know, that could spiral you out of control there. So, you know, I just thought I'd throw that in that you do mention your corporate life, but you know, that was during those years. It was so tough, you know, and you had to be so sharp and, you know, all the movies and books at the time, you know, was aligned with that whole thought, you know, you weren't successful unless you weren't the king of the hill or whatever have you, you know? Yeah, well, and yeah, and that's absolutely true what you've just said. I am not sure it's changed. I just think the, um, you know, how we view it's changed. Because, you know, I know people today that they work from home and they are just totally stressed out because they still have incredible demands. We have this collective sense that, um, you know, we got to earn more money. We got to get a bigger house. We need another car. We're, you know... the corporate world is they just, you know, there's, I'm not saying every company is like this, but they are so focused on the bottom line and wringing out every dollar they can. They might pay people well, 
but their demands on people and then our um, attachment to electronic goods uh, you know people are staring at their phones or their computer screens or their iPads or equivalent you know all the time yeah and they see solace and um, you know uh, respite from that by watching these uh, you know films which you know display violence and uh, hate and anger and revenge and uh, you know all kinds of uh, issues with families and you know it's just like it's just like it's just this constant churn if you think what you feed your body is important for your health i can tell you right now what you feed your mind is more important for your overall health and well-being yes. than what you feed your body yes most definitely and you know neil um on a personal note um i own a healthcare business with my husband uh, I am looking at purchasing another business. I do the Bookaholic podcast. It's growing. It's growing rapidly. And I love it. I mean, I, I love that. And, and I'm a person that can balance these different types of things. I'm also in several groups in my community. So I'm a community volunteer. I do a lot of things. Um, I'm a, now an officer in one of those groups. So, you know, I'm a busy person. But I find that unnecessarily, not like right now where I'm on the computer, you know, it's correct for me to be on the computer right now looking at the screen during the business day. But I find myself when at night I say I'm going to read uh, my books, I'm on my phone or I'm on my computer mindlessly scrolling looking for something to purchase that I don't need more. I don't need any more clothes. I don't need any more jewelry. And I will say, if you're constantly scrolling, that's anxiety and anxiousness in and of itself. And then if you're younger and you're scrolling and comparing yourself to these other people on Instagram, for an example, you know, that's all part of this whole thing that can cause a lot of anxiety and depression, um, you know, you know, and, and everything that you've said. And that's how a lot of people have committed suicide, comparing themselves to others online, you know. And so even as great as it is to have uh, Kindles and laptops and computers and our phones that are mini computers, you know, they that what we're putting in our mind, as you said, is just as important as what you put into your body. Well, I think it's even more important to be honest than what mm -hmm. you feed your body. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, we let our externalities drive our environment and how we yeah. behave and what we do. And um, when you read a higher road and you go through this process, you will come to understand this is the on in the science section of the book where I'm actually yeah. using things that are researched in science. Yes, you will understand that. Um, what you believe to be right or wrong, true or false, good or bad, and is really just a belief. And um, our externalities that we see is really a reflection of our beliefs. So it's mm -hmm. a reflection of our thinking and feeling patterns that we have developed and honed and shaped over a lifetime and reinforced. And right, right. life is not about what you own or what you do or how, you know, what other people think about you and, you know, trying to get to the top. That's what everybody scrambles to do in some way, shape or form. Yes. And well, life mean. is, life is really, when you actually understand this process, you will come to understand that life is really a journey within. Yes. All the peace, all the security, all of the love, all of the joy that you are searching for is in you. It is not outside of you. And when oh, you right. understand, and when you understand the mechanics of the universe, how yes. and why the universe was created and how we come into existence and how we use the tools of our creation through our thinking and feeling to create every event and every experience that comes into our life, sometimes immediately, 
sometimes, you know, in five years, 10 years, sometimes in 50 years, sometimes even in a next lifetime. Mm -hmm. When you understand these mechanics, how we create these um, life forms, if you will, these blueprints of future events and experiences and how we magnetize to them to attract these like events and like experiences into our lives based on your patterns of thinking and feeling, you can then make a choice of whether you want to carry on living life like you do, or you mm. want to begin this process to break up these patterns that cause these negative, miserable events in your life, yes. and replace them with uh, patterns which are consistent with where you come from. You come from unconditional love, and yes. you will return to unconditional love. And it's got nothing to do, you know, the soul has this evolutionary process where it comes into many lifetimes on this planet in varying genders, in varying colors of skin, in varying places of origin, sometimes highly educated, sometimes not educated at all, sometimes very wealthy, sometimes very poor. And mm -hmm. all of those things are designed to help the soul learn the lessons and and have the experiences that it wants to learn to take back into this realm of unconditional love yeah. and and when you understand that the ego is just a tool to help you your soul do this when i see a person today i see their soul their soul is equal to my soul their soul is perfect their soul is unconditional love the reprehensible things that they do or how they behave which may be harmful to others or hurtful to others or greedy or selfish mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. are all just mechanisms of the ego to create these events and experiences until finally in one lifetime the soul wakes up and says I now understand what I'm doing to myself and I want to undo this. I want to go back to expressing unconditional love to everything and everyone in our environment. And in yeah. order to do that, you need uh, you need some new knowledge and you need a process. And that's what I've outlined in a higher road. This is the process that I followed. Yes. So, you know, we make choices every day that affect us and affect other people. And you are not here to please God, you are here to express God and God is unconditional love. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just by the fact that I don't judge anybody for what they do, I know that, you know, the things that they're doing, which is harmful to other people or selfish or greedy, is really just this mechanisms of the ego that is helping their soul learn the lessons and experience the things that it wants to experience. Yes. But I can tell you that I started this process and a week before I sat down to craft this suicide note, I got some information. And this yeah. information promised to liberate me from my thinking. And I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna push out my suicide and I'm gonna try this. If it works, great, and if it doesn't, then I can always commit suicide. But if I commit suicide, I can't do this. So. I put the suicide aside, so to speak, and yeah. or I pushed it out and I started to study this material. A year later, I woke up and I realized that I my depression was totally gone. I was full oh, of I inner didn't. peace. I was full of inner peace and joy and love and I felt totally prosperous and abundant. 13 months, so this would be late December 2018. So I started this process in kind of November-ish of 2017. Mm -hmm. in, late de in late December 2018, I went into two meditations two days apart. And when you go through these meditations and you go through this process, what you do is you create new brain cells at the top of your brain underneath the skull, and they're impressed with new knowledge and they vibrate at a higher frequency of vibration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The source of our being is, is such at such a high frequency of vibration and so spiritually refined that it cannot enter into us and and make itself known to us because our human consciousness vibrates at such a low level. Mm. And you, you need to go through this process to be able to raise your uh, consciousness vibrations. So anyway, so you go through these these shifts in vibrational consciousness. And I went into two meditations where I just 
I was totally enveloped in unconditional love. And it's not like unconditional love that we talk about, unconditional love of my child and those kinds of things. It's, we don't have the language to even describe it. It is just totally, it, it totally filled me and enveloped me and, and I felt non-judged and I felt supported and it didn't matter what anybody had done to me in the past or what mm-hmm. I had done. I just oh, felt totally bathed in unconditional love. And it has been this evolving process since then to to assist me and help me to get to a point where I fully transcend my ego. And whether it's this lifetime or another lifetime, I don't know. But Mm -hmm. when you fully transcend your ego, all you want to do is, is express unconditional love to everybody, no matter what. And, and when you pass from that lifetime, you will step into the light and you will not need to be reincarnated again. And this is the process everybody goes through. And the only way to do this is you, you, you need this new knowledge. In my opinion, you need this new knowledge and you need this concrete steps that I've outlined in a higher road. And I can promise you if you follow it and if you, this process will build your faith. It will strengthen your faith. You have to not doubt when you're going through this process. Doubt creates its mm-hmm. own consciousness barriers that will prevent yeah. you from learning. Yes. And so when you go, th- so when you go through this process and you learn this meditation, you go into the silence and the stillness of your mind. You'll learn how to do this, and and I can tell you, you can do. It. You can stop all of your thoughts. It's it wow. takes practice, but you can do it. And when you do, what happens is you you will get to a point. So at the seven month mark, I felt the spiritual energy flowing into my head and then eventually in my whole body. And it would go into my head, would go down one side of my body, up the other side. Today, and it was just this little opening at the top of my brain. Today, you could put a bowl over my head that goes to the bottom of my ears and that's the opening in my head. And I have constant and, uh, you know, reciprocal communication with the source of our being and it guides me and it directs me and it it just bathes me in unconditional love and it is just this process of this spiritual awakening and this inner cleansing and rebuilding of your consciousness that you need to do and you will do this lifetime or some future lifetime but i but you know my my thinking is So when I wanted to take my MBA in the mid nineties, I thought, okay, so I'm working full time and it's a two year program. And geez, I don't know if I want to work and go to school, all that kind of stuff. And, um, I said to my wife, uh, I said, you know, I'm really debating. I don't know. This seems like a hard work. And she said, well, look, how long does it take? And I said, well, it's two years. And she said, okay, so two years from now, you can look back and say that you did it or you Mm -hmm. wish you did it. Right. What would you like to do? So, so when I say to this, you know, read my book cover to cover, understand the process in its entirety, make a decision for yourself. But when you learn these mechanics and you learn this information, I know there will be people people that won't pick it up and do it because they're not ready for it. I understand that. But there's a part of, but there is a little human part of me that says, why on earth wouldn't you? This is like the most amazing process and and when you get connected and supported with our from our creator with this beautiful inflow of of spiritual energy and support and love i mean you will look back at all of those times of misery and and hard times and instead of being regretful about what you did or you didn't do or how miserable your life was you look back and you'll and i look back now and i go i am so thankful all those things happened to me because all of yeah. those things got yeah. me to this place where I am today. Yes, yes, yes. You know, Neil, that is a tremendous amount of information for one to unpack. That's why it's so important that if you are feeling any way remotely how you were feeling uh, for someone who is at least going to give it one last try, that they should pick up your book and give a, at least one last try uh, to, to learn this process. Now, without giving the entire, there's a lot of things I want to go back to, without giving the entire book away, 
you say that this is a process and if I'm correct, there's seven steps to this process. That's correct. And I, one, one thing I want to stress is that this isn't only for people that are feeling miserable. This is for everybody. Yes. Yes. This would be great for anybody, even if you don't think you're experiencing any type of problems. No, but I tell you, if you're glued to your phone and you mm -hmm. are feeling stressed about work, even mm -hmm. though your your personal life, you know, this is something you want to look at. Like okay. I said, you know, I wish everybody in the world would read my book and make a decision for themselves. Yes. Yeah. And yes. then all of those people, you know, my goal is to share this information and, you know, to help people and, um, you know, it could be anybody, you know, right. You know, it could be, and, and as we more adults learn this process, we get to teach our children this process. Yeah. And as those children grow up with that process, they'll teach their children and we will bring this world into a new era of love and peace. Yes. But what has already been, so individually you create all these experiences and events that come into your life collectively with with um you know all the uh when we have these collective consciousness thinking and feelings around all of the negative things that we read in the newspapers listen to on the news watch in movies which are violent and degrading and harmful and vengeful and revengeful all of these things create consciousness forms collectively that must come into manifestation. They cannot be stopped. It's a law of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so we're at a point where there's going to be much worse things that go on because of the collective consciousness since, you know, probably the 80s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the stuff that, even the stuff, you know, probably back from the 50s really is when we really after the twenties is when we really started down this negative path of collective okay. consciousness through this increased media and, um, you know, availability of news. Like remember, you know, 200 years ago, something happened in one part of the country. No one would ever hear about it today. Correct. It's immediate. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Well, you know what I always famously say that 24 hour news cycle has done us in. And I'm not faulting, um, I don't want to mention a particular news station, but as soon as we came into that 24 hour news spin, and like when I was a little girl, TV actually went off the air. There was a certain time that it was yep, yep. off. And you couldn't see any more entertainment or any more news or any more anything, no matter how good you thought it was going to be, uh, it went off, you know, yep. and it didn't start again until about maybe seven o'clock in the morning. And that's what we are missing. Our grandmothers or great grandmothers did not have to listen to news day after day, pounding news and negative news day after day after day after day, you know? Yeah. And, um, so. and when TV first came out, it was pretty censored in terms of what you could say and what you could spread, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we used to, when I grew up, so you and I probably, you know, similar eras, mm -hmm. you know, five o'clock on a Saturday, all the stores closed. They didn't open again till Monday. Right. You said that there's a seven step process. Oh yeah. Right. Yep. What is the process. Did you read about this in some type of ancient tome or right. is it a process or is it a hybrid of both or how did you come to these seven steps? So first off, uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about what this, I, I look back now and I see it differently than I saw it at the time. Okay. So when I look back differently, the science material that I picked up and some of the uh, other things I share in a higher road, all of this share, is shared in details in a higher road. Yeah. But those science books I picked up and I read and um, these other kind of peripheral spiritual books, but based in uh, science, um, they were laying a platform for me to open my mind to mm -hmm. receive this new information that I received a week before I sat down to craft my suicide note. Mm -hmm. That information that I used, I call it a blueprint document. It's a bunch of material that I've gathered together. And when you read a higher road, you read it cover to cover, make a decision for yourself. You go back and you, if you, if it resonates with you and you want to do it, you go back and start with some of the science material or directly with step one. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
when you get to step two, I unveil these truths. And uh, I've gathered all of that information and I, in the in a higher road, I tell people how they can connect with me and get that information for free. Got you, got you, got you. So, now, so, go so, the, so the seven steps you wanted to? Well, I was just wondering, you know, uh, and I don't want to, unless you just want to name them, we don't need uh, yeah. to go into all of them because it's it would be quite a process for people and they need to read the book to find out how to achieve them. But yeah. can you name them for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first thing is, you know, we're going to open your mind, we're going to stretch your consciousness. So the first, really the first step is stretching your consciousness to give you a new concept of what consciousness really is. Okay. And I used to, and I, in my book, I talk about what I used to think consciousness is to what I know, know it is now today. And wow. those are entirely different things. So um, that's me. And I suspect that's going to be similar with other people. Yes. So the first is stretching your consciousness. The second step, I unveil these what I call truths. And this yes. is truths of the mechanics of the universe. Yes. Um, and it shares uh, so much material. There's so much to learn. It's they're concepts everybody will understand, but it, it describes exactly what was before the Big Bang, the impetus for the Big Bang, um, how the material universe came into being, and then how we use the tools uh, that were drawn from our creator, if you will, how we use those tools moment to moment to create every event and every experience that comes into our life. The ego was, was created at the time of the Big Bang. All of this is explained. And okay. you'll understand that process and why and how the ego was created. Okay. Uh, step three is really a reflection. And this is uh, you writing yourself uh, a letter uh, it's only for your eyes. It's not for anybody else's eyes. It's not for your spouse or to please a God or anything else. It is exactly for you to document how you feel about life right now. Okay. okay. Then you're going to put that letter away and you're going to uh, keep it stored for a year and you'll open it a year later if you follow this process. Wow. And what, what that does is that gives you a marker of how how the state you were in when you started to what your new state is going to be. Uh, the uh, fourth step, you're going to go through this process is some very specific things you need to cleanse out of your consciousness and you need to be able to go through a process to break up and dissolve these patterns of thinking and feeling that, that you've programmed in your subconscious and your unconscious mind. Okay. Step five is rebuilding your consciousness and you rebuild it in a way which is consistent with the golden attributes of divine consciousness. So where where we come from you're going to build it with those attributes okay. step six you're going to learn this meditation that enables you to enter into this silence and stillness yeah. and it is this is key and you learn it later in the process because you need to understand a bunch of stuff before you learn this meditation Got you. there's a reason why it comes later yeah and um when you enter into the silence and stillness, that is the process that you're going to use um, to be able to connect back with the divine, or or the or God, or the universal, or whatever you want to call it, Yahweh, Allah, the Tao. <laughs> wow. And uh, step seven is really a repeat process. It's a rinse and repeat, and you're going to, you know, continue to learn this new knowledge. You're going to continue to cleanse your consciousness and rebuild your consciousness and you're going to do this loop because there's like anything that's worthwhile in life there's no instant gratification right. and we are we are so used to instant gratification yeah. you know instant yeah. food and you know convenience yeah. of of clothes washers and dryers fantastic right yeah. But, yeah. but, you know, everything's instant we get and now with our phones, you know, we're, oh, I want to buy something, get on Amazon or wherever else and order it. You know, we buy it, you know, everything is instant, right? And we are so used to, uh, not being still and quiet, you know, I can tell you right now, here's a little clue. You know, you have a problem if you can't sit still in a chair with your own thoughts for more than five minutes. Yes. <laughs> yes, I agree. I agree. If your mind is jumping from place to place like a skipping, a rock skipping water, it, you, you are in trouble. 
you this yeah. is correct this is correct you know and as a matter of fact and i just read this as a blurb somewhere i can't even tell you where i read it but i was saying and i'm, I'm right now i'm on a very special diet i've lost a lot of weight so i'm really thankful for that but it was in this blurb it was saying you know say eat your breakfast don't you know, look at your phone, don't look at the computer, don't look at TV, don't do anything else. Just simply eat your breakfast. And I am practicing that because that's part of that. And eat your breakfast, digest your food, and that's all you need to do. You don't need to do 115 other things while you're, say, eating your breakfast, something very simple. That, that doesn't take long to do. It doesn't take long to eat breakfast. It's not like dinner or anything else or having dinner uh, and being at a dinner party. Eat your breakfast. That's plain and simple. And maybe that's almost a, a starting point for people to make sure that their mind's not jumping from place to place just to sit down and eat your breakfast. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a good, good tip. And um, in A Higher Road, I share with people how I was able to unknowingly and unwittingly at the time, I didn't do this by design, but I can look back now and say it was helpful. Mm -hmm. I learned how to stay focused to begin this process that was that helped me go through this process of being able to stop all my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I give some tips in a higher road on how I did that and it might work for uh, might work for the reader. <clears throat> yes, yes. Well, now going back to a couple of other things before we wind up, um, I was watching the Today Show the other day and Carson Daly was interviewing Molly Shannon, Molly Shannon who used to be on Saturday Night Live. And she wrote a memoir and, you know, she's has been this big time comic, you know, on Saturday Night Live, very successful. She's created some very successful characters. But little did you know that um, when she's talking about her memoir, she was in a bad accident when she was about four or five years old. In that accident, her mother dies, her youngest sister dies, and a cousin of hers dies. And her father is so injured that he has to learn to walk again. She and her other, another person, maybe another sibling, survive. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, she lost her mother at four or five years old. And in that, Carson Daly also shared that he lost his father when he was young, uh, when he was a child. And I think you said your father passed away also when you were a child. And it was interesting to hear Carson Daly say he wonders, and he's another person who is a high profile person who has dealt with um, mental health issues. And he's been a man who's come out to say, you know, hey, I had mental health issues. So do you, do you ever think about that, that maybe um, as a child losing a parent, maybe of how that might have affected you unknowingly or knowingly? Yeah, I do. I, I, um, I do think about it. And, you know, one would never know, um, yeah. you know, whether there was a difference or not, whether it would be <clears throat> um, helpful or not. But um, regardless of that, you know, I came in this lifetime to learn certain things. Mm -hmm. And I was going to learn those things no matter what. Right. So, so um, I don't concern myself with what impact did that have me have on me because now I look back and I go everything that happened to me was really a blessing right right so I don't I'm not concerned about that because when you actually understand how and why we're created and why we come here mm -hmm. you will have a new perspective of whatever why everybody does what they do yeah why the things that have happened in your life have happened Okay. And you will have the tools to understand all of this. And then you can consciously make a decision to carry on as you are or to do things differently. Yes. yes. And, and I can, and I can like, I'll repeat this, you know, the safety, the security, the peace, the joy, the love that you are searching for, it's mm -hmm. all inside of you. And yeah. you just need to know how to unlock it. Right, right. And the, the interesting thing to cap that story I was telling you about Molly Shannon and um, Carson Daly interview is that Molly Shannon wrote that she was blessed to have her mother for those four years. And that's how she took it. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Now, to tell you a personal story, 
um, about me and some things that you have said about the unconditional love. And um, I have never, to tell you this, I have never told anybody else this story except for my husband and my sons. I don't even think I've told my sisters, but I think it's very uh, important to share this here with you. So I'll tell you, Neil, uh, my mother died in 1996. So what does that mean to me? I got married in 1995. She died in 1996. My first child was born in 1998. So my mother never saw my children. Um, she did see where we were building a house. Um, you know, so she knew I was married and building a house and I guess on my way to further earthly living, but she died in 1996. So I've been without a mother since that time. But um, also a little history about myself and my mother when I was younger. And as a, as, as a lot of people do, me and my mom were, you know, we clashed. We clashed definitely during my teenage years on a variety of things, you know. You, you know how people go, I hate you, I hate this, or whatever have you. So we clashed and, and we had a difference of opinion. I thought she was mean. I thought she was all these things. And um, so, but on her deathbed, as she was dying, and it was not the day she died, but as, as she was dying, I asked her, I said, you know, why were you so hard on me? You know, and we talked through that because I was like, I am not going to let my mother die and we not have a conversation. And then I will just be forever be wandering from pillar to post, so to speak, in my mind of not knowing the answers of why my mother did some of the things that she did, I felt to me uh she was a good mother she you know wasn't anything striking but just the things you know i just wanted to be held more and i wanted to be told i love you and i but she was trying to make me strong and you know so there's all of that you know she was from that generation that grew up during the depression so you know i'm sure that had a lot to do with it but anyway through all of that so one evening while, um, after she had passed away. And it wasn't, I can't tell you, it wasn't a year after she passed, but it wasn't immediately after her death. Um, we went to bed. It was bedtime. My husband and I were in the bed. We were asleep. And in that sleep, I felt this extreme warmth and love and caring and glowing hold on my body. It is if I was wrapped up like a Christmas gift with love and warmth and it warmed my heart and the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I have never felt something so intense, so warm, so loving, so beautiful and pleasant in all of my life. Like you said earlier in our conversation, you can't put this into words. And I uh, finally, after enjoying that beautiful, almost floating type of feeling, I awoke and I was like, just basking in that glow. And I looked to the left, I was like, oh, my husband must have been just holding me and hugging me. And I looked to the left, my husband is all the way over to the other side of the bed, you know, not even facing me. So I was like, well, that wasn't him. And, you know, I just felt like that was a very spiritual, I always felt like that that was my mother hugging me and telling me that I do love you. I did love you, you know, and I'm on this other side now. I just want you to know that I love you because I was still thinking about after she had died, I was still thinking about our clashes and all of this stuff. And that seemed to have stopped. Uh, that action seemed to have stopped me. But I, I will say to you, I will say to anyone, this is not all there is. I know there's something else. And that warmth and deep spirituality that I felt told me so. Yeah, no, and I'm so glad that you felt that and how, uh, you know, blessed are you that you felt that uh, yeah. at the time. And, yeah. um, you know, and I have felt that as well through going through this process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah it very well could have been your mother that was doing that for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, she's there all the time. She's supporting you. She's helping you, right? Yes. And yeah. she's there all the time. And you can yeah. connect back with her if you want. If you go through this process, you can do this. Yes. Um, uh, you know, so 
yeah, I don't know what to say. I just, I'm yeah. so glad that you, you know, that you experienced that. Yes, it's, it's overwhelming, but it's overwhelmingly beautiful. And yeah. uh, again, I will say the reason why I'm doing this mental health um, series is that so that people can know, hey, this is not all there is. There is hope. There's been people to walk down a similar path as you and they have different approaches and different techniques but you know give yourself a chance give yourself a shot at this thing called life so neil i i just really appreciate you being on my show i know that someone even if it's just one person is to hear your story um to and to pick up your book that they too will be transformed and just to remind everybody the name of your book is a higher road Cleanse your consciousness to transcend the ego and ascend spiritually. This is a seven step process to enter peace, joy, love, abundance, and prosperity. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and uh, just so everybody knows, uh, it's by D. Neil Elliott and it's available wherever books are sold. Um, you know, Amazon has it in uh, uh, both, well, in hard copy and in paperback copy and in ebook, and it's in all your favorite ebook forms Kindle, Apple, Nook, and Kobo, and available globally. Yes, here's my version. It's on my Kindle. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, and yes, and so we'll have all of Neil's information in the show notes uh, of the podcast and down below in the YouTube video, all his social media handles, how you can access his book and his website. And so we just want to make sure that everybody has access to all the positivity that they possibly can. Thank you, Neil. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. I very much appreciate being on, the, on your show today. Thanks again. Thank you for joining the Bookaholic Podcast. We appreciate your support. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on Instagram at True Bookaholic. You can also email us at readingjunkie at book-a-holic.com. Don't forget to support your local library and independent bookstores.